a lot of announcements before we got there, but here we go. So we're going back to 1 Thessalonians, okay? So we took a pause for COVID three weeks. We're going back to it. So I want us to get our minds around it. And the focal point for this morning is this. In order for your faith to be strong, okay, and your love to be overflowing. So hopefully if you're a Christian, this is the desire of your heart. You want your faith to be strong and your love to be overflowing. So in order for that to take place, okay, especially in uncertain times, it is critical for you to know a few things that we're going to be talking about today, okay? So that's our focus. Now, Paul and his companions were apostles. They were church planters, and they were spreading the good news from Jerusalem all around the area. So they were going from city to city, place to place, starting first with the Jewish people, if there was a synagogue there, and telling them from the Old Testament scriptures, pointing out that Jesus indeed is a long-awaited Messiah. So he went from place to place, and once he communicated to the Jewish people, then they would go to the Gentiles, these are non-Jewish people, and communicate the gospel. And now in some places, there was a huge reception to this message. Message. In other places, there was huge resistance to that message. In most places, there was a mix between a, a reception and a persecution. So they're moving from one place to another place. And so they're at their city called Thessalonica, and we'll see a map in just a little bit. Okay, And they had to flee from that place, and Paul wrote this more than likely from Athens when he sent these people, or Corinth, okay, so he was writing letters back, the very word of God which is given to us as well. Okay, so we're going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. We're going to read actually an entire chapter, and then we're going to look at three questions from the text. So I'm just going to read it in its entirety. The verses will be up here. Also, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. Okay, I'm using the NLT today with some little modified phrases. So if you're wondering what version, that's what's in front of us here. Okay, so I'm going to read it in its entirety, and then we're going to break it down looking at three very vital and important questions. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, here we go. Dear brothers and sisters, Paul writing to these people whom he dearly loves. After we were torn away from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you. And I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. After all, what is our hope or joy or crown or boasting that we stand in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our glory and joy. Finally, when we could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens. And we sent this young man, Timothy, to visit you. He is our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. We sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you were going through. But you know that we are destined for such troubles. Now, even while we were with you, we warned you that troubles would soon come. And they did, as you well know. That is why, when I could bear it no longer, <laughs> I sent Timothy Timothy, to find out whether your faith was still strong. You hear his love and his concern for them. He says, I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you. And then our work among you was useless. But now, Timothy has just returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy, and you want to see us as much as we want to see 
with you. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering. Dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in your faith, it gives us new life to know that you're standing firm in the Lord. Now we thank God for you. Because you, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Night and day, we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again to fill the gaps in your faith. <coughs> May God our Father and the Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. And may the Lord make your love for one another and all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your hearts strong and blameless and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. Amen. Okay? That was a big chunk of scripture, right? But we're going to look at a number of things from this text. And I had to read it to you in entirety. And I'm going to highlight a number of things and hopefully bring this together for you. So we're going to look at three questions. Okay? Number one, do you know how loved you are? Are. That's the first question. Second, do you know how vulnerable you are? And third, do you know what is most important? Do you know how loved you are? Do you know how vulnerable you are? <laughs> do you know what is of most importance? First question, do you know how loved you are? You are loved by the great shepherd, and you are loved by the under shepherds, spiritual leaders, me as your pastor, other spiritual leaders love you. Why? Because the great shepherd loves you. We love because he first loved us. We say men to that. It's a supernatural love that goes beyond natural human affection and affinity. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> those loves are important, but this is a love that supersedes and is above those love. This is the love of the great shepherd that is expressed in the body of Christ and in particular to shepherds who God gives us. So we recognize that in Thessal Thessalonica, in this city, there was persecution. And scripture says that we were, they were torn away from you. Okay? Now, this just wasn't like some traveling spiritual salesman. Okay? These people who are, I am, they're champs, right? They want to come to you not to give you something. They want to come to you to get something, right? Particular things with numbers behind them, right? They're not coming bringing the word, the true word of the Lord, okay? They're coming in to say something, to receive something primarily, and to move on. They don't care about you. They care about what you can give to them, okay? That was a problem then, and this is a problem today, and Paul was saying, listen, we had to leave. We didn't want to leave. We were torn away from you, right? You can imagine being in a war-torn country and having to be <coughs> separated from your family, right? And there's a tearing away, right? Because his heart was with them, but because of what was taking place, there was a tearing away. So Paul says, hey, I want you to know... <coughs> I love you regardless. And we had to leave and it broke our hearts. Right? If you are under someone who is under and has a love of God, they will love you. Right? Not what, because of what they can get from you, but because of God's goodness in you. Okay? And so he was torn away from them, and he longed to be with them. And he said he tried very hard, 
to come to them time and time and time again. Again, he wasn't just passing through and trying to get what he can. And they like, I might want to go back there because they gave us a, another offering. And nothing to do with that. It's because of their spiritual connection and their deep love. His deep love for them because God gave him a deep love for them. He said, I tried very hard to come back to you, but was hindered by Satan himself. And we're going to get there in just a second. Paul in verses 19 and 20 <clears throat> called the people in this church his pride and joy, his glory and his crown. And he says a very interesting phrase that his hope is when he stands in the presence of Jesus, when he returns, that he will boast and talk about them. Okay. Now, if you have children or if you have grandchildren, we see them often as our pride and our joy, right? We see them that way. I have two kids, and they are my pride and joy, right? I'm grateful for them, and I often talk about them to other people. Hey, let me tell you about Anna. Let me tell you about Deborah. Now, Paul saw this church right? that way. He says, hey, when I get in front of Jesus, right, I'm not going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about you. And here's the deal. I feel the same way about you. Right? When it's my turn to cross into the presence of God, I say, Jesus. Right? I can't imagine what that will be like. Right? Here's the map of the journey. Okay, there you see it there. We can go on. I can't imagine what that would be like there. And then, you know what I want to tell him about? I don't want to talk to him about, hey, Jesus, did you see that one time where I gave that? Did you see that? Right? Hey, Jesus, you see how dedicated I was? Right? Aren't I awesome? <laughs> okay? I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about you. Jesus, hey, let, you, let me tell you about this church. Let me tell you the love they have for one another. Let me tell you about the time when they gathered all their stuff together and they gave it away to the community. Hey, Jesus. Hey, Man, I can't believe there's this guy in his, in his wheelchair. He's been bound and we're in COVID and he was in his house for, for, a, uh, for a year. Couldn't get out. It was his 50th birthday. You know what they did? They got together and they made sides. They drove by. They bought him a TV. They did all this stuff and they gave him love. Isn't that amazing? Hey, Jesus. Jesus. Hey, let me tell you about this place where they sacrificed and they took out second mortgages to, to build a building so that they can reach a community for God. Jesus, let me tell you about these people who came every week on, on Wednesday nights and on other nights of the week, Thursday nights, to love on community kids. When they were tired, when they were lonely, they gave and they loved. Hey, Jesus, let me tell you about these two guys. They're like 75 years old and they're shoveling all the sidewalks all around tell you about them. I want you to know that you are loved, not just by the great shepherd, but God gives us shepherds and leaders and people that'll love you because God loves you. That's the great curiosity about the church. Right? <coughs> There's people of all ages. There's people of all backgrounds. There's people of all education levels and income levels. There's people of all languages. There's people who live in huts to high rises. And yet they communicate together. And you think of the world, why would these people be together? Because what binds us together is greater than anything that will separate us. And that's the gospel and the love of God. This is how the community knows. That we are his disciples if we love one another. This is why there is an emphasis. This is why Pastor Lee talked about loving one another. And God help us to love one another. And God help us to know how loved we are. It breaks my heart during this COVID time, all right? It's hard for you. It's hard for us. There's Dan over here who is a pastor at Bethesda right down the road. We know, and pastors know, how hard this has been. Right? Does anyone like wearing masks? Anyone enjoy that? Anyone? 
Does anyone enjoy social distancing? Does anyone enjoy isolation? Does anyone enjoy canceling all the events that we look forward to? Nobody. It is hard when there's separation. It's hard when you can only see eyes. It's hard as a pastor when I don't know who's online. Right? There's some people I haven't seen for a year and a half. And it breaks my heart. Being together as a body of a Christ is important. You say amen to that. Because God built us in community. And for love to be expressed, there needs to be connection. There needs to be vulnerability. There needs to be community. And it is hard. But nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So this is a hard time. And they were going through a separation there. And they were distanced from one another because of persecution. But their love continued to remain. So let us look how we can love one another. Extra, not just convenient love. When I say convenient love, it's convenient to say hello to someone who's standing here. It's actually rude if you don't, right? I'm talking inconvenient love. It's inconvenient to go out in the middle of winter to provide someone a meal. It's inconvenient to make a phone call, right, or reach out. I'm talking inconvenient love, <clears throat> love that goes beyond borders and boundaries and separations. Paul says when he could stand it no longer, he wanted to know how they were doing, stand it no longer. So you see this angst. You see this desire, you see this continual prayer, and he's praying. He says, once they found out you're doing well, greatly encouraged, gave them new life, and they were going through persecution. So, one of the primary ways that God's love is shown to us is through the body of Christ, through spiritual shepherds, through spiritual leaders in the community of faith in the church. And it is important for you to know, to know and experience this kind of love. It's important for us to express it to one another and demonstrate it. It is important. So number one, I want you to know how loved you are. Okay? This is a prayer that I have. This is a prayer that we need to be expressing to one another. Second, I want you to know how vulnerable you are. You are not as strong as you think you are. You're way more vulnerable than you know. We are, number one, (coughs) vulnerable to isolation. Satan himself (coughs) works to separate us from those who will help us in our faith. Right, let's return to the text, verse 18. Because we wanted very much to come to you. And I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. Have you ever noticed how hard it is sometimes to connect, right? Isn't it uncanny how things come up right before church, right? You probably experienced that this morning, right? Where's my boots? Where's my hat? Why is it so cold, right? Sunday morning, your kids start fighting, or someone's throwing up on the dog, right? (laughs) Or your your tire blows out, right? Or you're just super tired, right? Or something Saturday night happened, you stayed up way later, and then like, wow, your alarm clock doesn't go off, right? Has that ever happened to you? Happens all the time, right? Why is it so hard that our technology doesn't work on Sunday, right? Every other day it's fine. All of a sudden it's Sunday. It's not working, right? Now, I'm not one who believes that there's a demon behind every doorknob, right? But I want to be aware that there's spiritual warfare happening, right? This is not just a natural thing, right? There's a supernatural thing with eternal benefits and consequences on the line. And there is an actual enemy that presses in against us. And he says, hey, I wanted very much to come to you, but Satan prevented us. 
And we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 to be aware of the devil's schemes. It says we are not unaware of his schemes. Because his scheme is to divide and to conquer isolation, intimidation, obliteration. So the first step is to isolate you from people who can help you in the faith, in the body of Christ. First step, right? Well, I don't need to go to church today. I've read the Bible mostly. Here's the problem. Now, missing a day, got it. Missing a week, got it. But if a day turns into a week, it turns into a month, it turns into a year, it could turn into a decade, first you isolate. And then in isolation, you intimidate. They don't really love you. Hey, the gospel really isn't true. You know, Christianity is, mm, you know. Isolation, intimidation, obliteration. I want to let you know the devil does not have your best interests in heart. But this is how it works. So you and I are vulnerable To isolation. We have to work to be together. And this is not your pastor talking to you about about church growth. There's nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with your spiritual vitality and your eternal existence. You have to fight for it. You have to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. There are people in India and Africa, right, who will go in, in Latin America and other in places I have been that will travel, walk three hours to be together with their church community and then walk three hours back. And we can't drive three miles. Now you're messing, Pastor. This blows my mind. My hope is that in this time of isolation and separation, the community and the body of Christ, our love will grow fonder for each other versus, well, you know, I really didn't like them that much anyway. You want to know what keeps me up at night? That keeps me up at night. What's happening? And you think, well, you know, my faith is strong. You're vulnerable for isolation. You have to fight to be together because Satan himself works to separate you from those who will help you grow. Fight like your life depends upon it. You are vulnerable to tribulation. Tribulation and troubles can shake, discourage, and weaken your faith. We see this again in the text, in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. He says, we sent him, which is Timothy, to what? Strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, and keep you from being shaken by the troubles that you were going through. Your dad gets cancer. Your boss fires you. Your relationship goes south. Instead of things coming together, they are falling apart. Has anyone here ever faced afflictions before? They're here, afflictions and hardships and distress and adversity. When we go through these things, you get COVID, you get sick. Something happens, a divorce happens, a relationship. All of these things happen. People are coming against you because of your faith, right? And in these things, they require strength from us. And in these things, we can become weak and discouraged and shaken in our faith. 
had conversations that I've known of with, with people that says, well, I prayed for my grandma, my grandma died, so therefore God isn't real and I'm walking away. Troubles can affect our faith. And I do not want you to fall for the unbiblical and demonic theology that if you are a Christian and have faith that everything will go right for you, or that you'll have no trouble or hardship or suffering, because that's not the truth. I've seen, me, I've seen many people's faith be shipwrecked on the rocks of difficulty because they believed a lie that if they were in Christ, everything will go well for you. You will face things just like everyone else. But the difference between you and someone else who doesn't have faith is that your faith will see you through because of the grace and love of God. And I love that Paul says, hey, 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 right? This is in verses 3 and 4. But you know that we are destined for such troubles. Put that on your mirror and memorize it. You are destined. He said, we're destined for these. Why? Because there, we have faith, not because of lack of it. He says, even while we're with you, we warned you that troubles would soon come. And they did, as you well know. This is not soft-serve Christianity. Okay. We do not need churches in America to spoon-feed people to make sure that they keep attending and giving their money. Ugh. You need to be prepared right, by the gospel, by truth that will make you strong, that will make you endure. Paul the Apostle says, because we love you, we told you it's the truth. Right? Hey, these things will come. Right? Hang on to one another. There's going to be a blizzard. Right? See each other's taillights. Be close to one another. Be prepared. Hang on. Right? Or like um, people going up a mountain, right? You rope each other in. Because there's going to be some things that are going to be tough. There's going to be a blizzard. There's going to be an ice wall. There's going to be perhaps an avalanche. Things will come, but keep close to each other. Keep close to the Lord. <laughs> because we're vulnerable to isolation. You are vulnerable in tribulation. And you and I are vulnerable to temptation. Have any of you ever done anything that you regret doing? <laughs> ah, I think I wrote the book sometimes, right? Why? Oh, I was so dumb. I know it's even worse. I'll do it again. Right? You're loved. You're vulnerable. So am I. Scripture talks about this. This is James, and I love this. Each person should be up here. Each person is tempted <clears throat> when he or she is lured and enticed by their own desire. <laughs> I like this word, lured. Anyone here like to go fishing? Right? Love fishing. It's great, right? I love tackle box. In the tackle box, what do I have in there? I got some hooks and I got some lures, right? These are things that trick the fish in biting, right? And now, if you're a good fisherman, you kind of hide the hook, right? And so this is what it says. It says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, right? So I think the devil is a fisherman, right? Now it's not by, um, yeah, we're called to be fishers of men, but not like the devil fishes. The devil fishes to destroy you, okay? And so if I was going to catch me, a person, I would disguise the hook, right? Right? 
This is how the devil works. He gets his hooks and then rolls us and reels us into places we never intended to go. Right? I won't hurt you. Right? And he doesn't use worms and minnows. He uses stuff like money. Right? I know how to catch me one of them fishes. Come on. So chase that. Come on. Come on. We see that and we're like, I think I like that. <laughs> And all of a sudden, right? Wait a second. What did you do? I got right to the ocean. That was disgusting. Okay. <laughs> Pick your poison. What's the bait for you? It's a lot of them. Comes in all types of shapes and colors. Things you can buy, experiences you can have, things that you can snort or drink or whatever. Here's the deal you are vulnerable to temptation. And he lures us all the time. He's fishing for you, friend, right? He is fishing for you. He wants to get you hooked, and he wants to bring you in, tie you up, cut you down, and destroy you. When desire is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's really grown, brings forth death. So in our faith, and if you want your faith to grow strong, if you want your love to be overflowing... You have to understand first how loved you are. Second, how vulnerable for you are. And don't think you're not vulnerable. You're vulnerable. So what? Be on the lookout. Fight for being together. Understand what is taking place. Look for the hook. And if you get hooked and if you get Isolated. This is where the body of Christ comes together. Will you please reach out to other people? That's an amen spot right there. I haven't seen who, whomever for a long time. Give them a call, please. I can't call everybody. I don't even know everybody. Right? Will you do that? Will you... Have inconvenient love. Bring them to your house. If you want to wear a mask, great. If you don't, then don't. Whatever. Okay. Connect with one another and know that you're hooked. If you're hooked right now, okay, here's another lie. You can unhook yourself. You can't. Well, I'm embarrassed. Would you rather to be embarrassed or dead? There's no shame. Anytime someone that comes to me and says, hey, I'm hooked into this or that or the other thing, I don't say, well, how dare you? Never say that. You know what I say? Thank you for being honest. There's no shame. Let's talk. Let's take this out. Let's get some healing. Let's get some help. And just like any room, there are people in here who are hooked to one thing or another. I'm telling you, hey, talk to someone. Hey, this is happening. I'm getting dragged away. I'm going to places I don't want to go. And things are happening to me that I don't want to be experiencing. God gives you others because of his love for you to help us. To go for it. So first, I want you to know how loved you are. Second, I want to know how, I want you to know how vulnerable you are to fight. You have to overcome. You have to press forward. These things will happen. You can overcome these things by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You can't do it yourself. But he can. Thirdly, important. Do you know what is most important? 
And I'm going to give you the answer. Here it is. What is most important is the strength of your faith and the depth of your love. This is what Paul was dying to know. He was asking, do they still have faith? Do they still have love? When he could not wait any longer to know, he sent Timothy to find out. And he came back and said, they still have faith and they still love. Because he was concerned that temptations and isolations would come in and destroy this newly found church. And he was most concerned about their faith and their love. This is what he was most concerned about. And he ends this section with a beautiful prayer. And I want you to notice what he does not pray for. He does not pray that they'd be taken out of persecution. He didn't pray for that. He didn't pray that they would be comfortable. He did not pray that life would be great for them. He doesn't pray for healing or riches or power. <laughs> know what he prays for? In verse 12, he prays, May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow. Did you catch that? The middle of persecution, middle of isolation, middle of difficulty. And the prayer is, may the Lord make your love for one another and all people grow and overflow. What? So how should we be praying for Myanmar? Am I praying for peace? Yes. Am I praying for justice? Yes. But know how we should be praying? God made the Christians there. Love one another. May they love even those who are persecuting them. Aren't we to pray that they get out of persecution? Surely. But the thing that matters most is not if you're in persecution or in comfort, but that you still love the Lord and love others. That's most important. But we pray so often for things that don't matter. God, I pray that my hair grows back. It's not. And it doesn't matter. So when you read the New Testament, you are reading, aren't you? I can't read the Bible for you. You have to read it and allow it to read you. When you read, I want you to pay attention not only to the text and the truth that's there, but pay attention to the prayers. What are they praying for? What are they not praying for? Paul is praying for what's most important through the power of the Holy Spirit. May the, love, may the Lord make love your love for one another, for all people grow and overflow. And, check this out, right? <clears throat> may he, this is verse 13, <clears throat> as a result, make your heart strong. We have to connect these together. Okay? May the Lord first make your love for one another and all people grow and overflow. That's a good prayer. Right? And now once that you're, you have love that is overflowing, be, uh, built upon a faith that is solid, okay, May he, as a result, God is doing this work, mind you. Okay? I'm not telling you, you better love more. I'm telling you, get connected to the true vine and let his love flow through you. Okay? You don't have the love that it takes to love like this. That, that should make you feel okay. It makes you feel pretty good, actually. What? I'm not good enough? No, you're not. Neither am I. Guess who is? Jesus. We connect to him. So may your love <clears throat> for one another grow, and may he, as a result, make your heart strong, blameless, holy, as you stand before God our Father when the Lord Jesus comes again with his holy people. So if you want 
to be holy before God, then ask him to fill your heart with an overflowing love for one another. <laughs> did, you catch, did you catch this? Right? May he, as a result, make your heart strong. If you want your heart to be strong, pray for overflowing love. If you want to be blameless, pray for overflowing love. If you want to be holy as you stand before God, pray for overflowing love. The road to Christ-likeness is the way of love that is in Christ. And if you love other people, you won't sin against them. You will show them and give them the best. And yes, times we fail. Through our faith in him, God makes us holy by pouring his love into our faith that overflows to others. So the most important thing okay, is a solid faith resulting in an overflowing love. That's central. So how do you build a solid faith? You can get connect, connected to the word. You get connected to people who will help you grow in your faith. This is how we grow. Now the result should not be that you would win every single Bible trivia contest. Now I hope you know more. That's, okay. That's, that's important. Right? But the Pharisees knew a whole lot more than the disciples. Isn't that kind of strange? That Jesus, the Pharisees are religious leaders back in Jesus' day. Okay. Isn't it strange that Jesus didn't go to the local um, Bible school and select his 12 disciples from those people? Have you ever thought about that? I did. I went to Bible school. Right? Would he select me? Does that kind of seem weird to you? Why wouldn't they go there? Why wouldn't Jesus go down to Sanhedrin, these are like, you know, the elders, and pick his disciples from those people. Why? Only one of the, the apostles were a part of them. Know what his name was? Paul. Know what had to happen to him? He could get knocked off his religious high horse. Thank you for that laughter. Confronted by God, blinded for a while. Showed him that he was really blind. And he had to be remade. I think Jesus sovereignly chose the people that he did to be his apostles, the twelve. Not their capacity for knowledge, but their capacity for love. Do you love one another? Now, knowledge is important. But again... You're not going to get to heaven. It's not going to be a Bible trivia contest. Right? Name the 12 apostles. Your eternity is dependent upon this. <gasps> now, is it good to know the 12 apostles? Sure. Right? You know he's going to look for? Christ-likeness. You're part of the family. You look like Jesus. Not that you're a 33-year-old, short Jewish guy. Not physically. Eternally. That you love one another. So I'm going to come in for a landing. There's a lot of, a lot of scripture here. So my prayer, my prayer, and the question before God is, how can we make our faith stronger how can we best love one another and the rest of the world? That's the right prayer. How can we make our faith stronger? I'm asking this question. I want you to do the same. How can we best love one another and the rest of the world? We need to focus on what is most important. <laughs> we need to watch out for the working of the devil, yes, and connect ourselves to the community of faith with those who will build our faith. And we are to love one another deeply from the heart. So that's my prayer for us. Right? 
that this would be the hallmark. We grow in grace, absolutely. Bring about the obedience of faith, right? You guys, have you heard this before? Bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. But it has to start in particular during times of difficulty. And when it's most difficult, this is when the church should arise. And we should not be surprised that politics and face masks and all of these things are dividing people. Fight for unity. Fight for the gospel. Fight for things that matter. So God, here we are in this room. Here we are reading your word in a very, very cold Sunday. God, I ask that this word, your word, would sink into our hearts. God, I ask that each one of us will know how deeply loved we are by you and how we are loved by the shepherds that you give to us. Second, Father, I ask that you would help us to understand how vulnerable we are, that we would shore up our hearts against isolation and temptation and tribulation, that we would stand with you and in you and be aware of what's taking place. Make us wise, I ask. And thirdly, Lord, we ask that this church and all churches who are seeking after you and standing on your gospel will be strong in the faith. From our friends right down the road at Bethesda to other churches in this area and to all over the world that we would be people who love one another and stand firm in the faith because you loved us first. And God, we pray that you would forgive us of our separations and our disconnections and our irritations and our aggravations. God, we ask that you would fill our hearts with greater love. God, I do pray for those who are hooked into something today that has got a hold of them. Father, that there would be a season now of freedom of vulnerability, of honesty. And that there would be great fruitfulness in this place. We're grateful for the promises we have in you. We look forward to seeing you again face to face. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.